Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April Pacific Northwest Dews, Drought, and Climate Outlook webinar. Uh, this webinar is part of a bi-monthly series co-organized by CERC, NIDAS, the Northwest Regional Climate Hub, and the National Weather Service. My name is Megan Dalton. I'm with CERC, or the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium. CERC is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program. CERC supports communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Western Montana as they work to adapt to the changing climate. We do this by transforming the latest climate science and data into usable knowledge. Um, on the agenda today, um, Britt, are you able to advance the slides? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, on the agenda today, we have a Britt Parker, the NIDAS Pacific Northwest Regional Coordinator, who will introduce NIDAS in the, in the Pacific Northwest dues. Then Phil Mote, Oregon State Climatologist, will present a climate recap and current conditions. And then following that, Jeremy Wolf with the National Weather Service, Spokane Weather Forecast Office, will present the climate outlook. Then Sarah Kapnick with NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab will present on recent research around snowpack prediction. And then finally, Lee Kalsitz with Washington State University will present recent research on developing climactic resilience for tree fruit production in Washington State. Um, and just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on drought.gov later this week. If you have questions during the presentations, please use the chat box or the question box and we'll take questions at the end of all presentations or in between the presentations if we have time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Britt Parker. Thank you, Megan. Um, as Megan said, I'm with NOAA and the National Integrated Drought Information System. I'm the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest and the Missouri River Basin. So I wanted to take just a couple quick minutes to talk about NIDAS in case you're not familiar with our program and our partners. Our mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. So we want to improve our understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment, and to improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of, use of early warning information for drought risk management. And our approach to achieve that goal is to build on the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional drought early warning system, where networks of partners and stakeholders share information um, and actions to help communities cope with drought. So, as I said, the ultimate goal is a national early warning system, but we recognize the impacts and early warning information differ across the regions, and each, or each region has many of the same base ingredients, but ultimately have their own flavor of drought, and, and that reflects in the needs of the region. So the basic components focus on observation and monitoring, prediction and forecast, planning and preparedness, communication and outreach, and interdisciplinary research and applications. And the intent is to build capacity for better decision making. The Pacific Northwest Dues was officially launched in February of 2016 after a year of scoping workshops and outlook forums to collect feedback on, from stakeholders in the region on needs. There is a strategic plan, which is on drought.gov. It's a roadmap for the region, and we consider it a living document that changes as the needs change in the region. But specifically, it identifies existing and new drought-related activities with priorities including improving monitoring and research, expanding drought early warning communication and outreach, optimizing information and collaborative networks, and enhancing drought planning and mitigation. We do these um, webinars every other month, so mark your calendar. The next one is June 25th, 2018, um, and registration, recordings, and other information on the webinars can be found on drought.gov. And just to note that after today's webinar, you'll have the uh, opportunity to provide feedback to help us improve and make these more meaningful to you. And before I turn um, it over to our first presenter, I want to remind everyone of Coco Ross, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. This is a unique nonprofit community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds who work together to measure and map precipitation, whether it be rain, hail, or snow, as well as condition reporting. So by using low-cost measurement tools and interactive website, the aim is to provide the highest quality data for natural resource managers, educators, and resource applications in all 50 states. So your data can help fill gaps in your area where weather stations don't exist. 
And this information will be applied um, to daily situations ranging, ranging from water resource analysis and severe storm warnings to neighbors comparing how much rain fell in their own backyards. On the right, you see figure A is the precipitation accumulation for two days in August with a weather station alone, and figure B includes the information from the weather station as well as data observed by Coco Ross observers. And you can see that the observations of precipitation um, really do add to our understanding of these events. So if you would like to um, become a volunteer, you can visit cocoross.org or contact your state coordinator, and I'll cut and paste their contact into the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to the first presenter. All right, thanks, Brett. So uh, first we have Phil Mote with um, giving the climate recap. Hi, everybody. Um, can you see my slide yet? Yes, yeah. okay, good. So I'm uh, presenting on behalf of CERC and the Oregon Climate Service, uh, which is led by Kathy Gallo uh, and by the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, OCRI. And I want to um, call out John Abatsiglu and Catherine Hagewish at University of Idaho, who are um, important partners of, uh, in CERC who have uh, generated this climate mapper that I'm going to use for most of my slides. And uh, I hope this... Uh, this works okay. So, is the slide advancing yet? There. Okay. Uh, it's a little sluggish here, so I'll, I'll try to get ahead of myself. Um, this is a screenshot of the toolbox. It's climatetoolbox.org, and although it's labeled Northwest Climate Toolbox, m much of the data actually covers the continental U.S. Um, it was built with support from CERC and the USDA Regional Climate Hub, and it is, in fact, still under uh, development. But um, I'm going to be showing features from the climate uh, one, uh, the climate tool. Um, sorry, this is, I don't know why we're not advancing. Um, Very bothersome. Um, so it looks like I have to put it in play mode and then advance. And then, uh, so this is the uh, last 90 days temperature anomaly from the climate mapper, and uh, you you can uh, pan and zoom just like with the regular uh, mapper. And so this is the default view, the northwest, um, and it's been. Um, slightly cooler than average over most of the Northwest, but, but um, really not very remarkable. Um, and uh, whereas if we uh, zoom out to the, uh, the whole West, um, we can see um, much of the Southwest has been um, a, a couple of degrees warmer than average, and uh, the Northern Great Plains uh, quite a bit cooler than average. So, a, a little bit of a dipole, and, and you'll hear from Jeremy later about the uh, status of La Nina, um, but this, this sort of gradient in temperature anomalies is, is roughly what we uh, expect with the La Nina, with it warmer in the south and, and a little cooler um, up here in the north. Um, looking at precipitation, um, generally the northern part of the west has been uh, wetter than average, so most of Washington wetter than average, northern Idaho and central Idaho wetter than average, and most of Oregon uh, a little bit drier than average, uh, but really only about um, 10 or 15 percent um, below average. Um, then you get down into the southwest and, uh, again, typical for La Nina, the, the deep southwest has been um, quite a bit um, drier than average. So this is, uh, again, this is, um, uh, instead of 90 days, this is since January 1st, and the uh, um, uh, browns are, are uh, percentiles lower than average, and greens are above average. Um, drilling down into the sort of day-by-day -day story, um, I'm going to show you a transect across the Northwest from uh, Seattle to uh, Pendleton and then Pocatello, Idaho. Um, 
So this graph, uh, the, the top curve, the top panel has a smooth curve, which is the average uh, daily temperature in an, uh, in a 30 year average. And then the reds are uh, days that are warmer than that average and blues are cooler. Uh, the middle panel is the same thing except just with the, um, the normals subtracted so that, uh, so that you see it's, um, there are anomalies with respect to zero instead of with respect to the, the daily average. And then the bottom panel shows the maximum and minimum temperatures for each day uh, in red and blue respectively. And the y-axis is degrees Celsius, so if you want a marker, the zero C line is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, looking at Seattle and Pendleton, you know, the general evolution of the last 90 days was somewhat similar. Uh, kind of a warm period in mid-January to early February, uh, and then much of it, uh, February was a little cooler than average. And then since then, it's really been sort of average, average. Things have just gone up and down, not, not a whole lot um, uh, warmer or cooler than average. Um, and then if we uh, shift the view slightly farther east, so uh, now Pendleton uh, on the left, the same graphs as before, uh, and Pocatello on the right, again, you see a lot of similarities uh, with that, that warm period and then the cool period and then just sort of average average. Um, and then similarly for uh, precipitation, um, uh, the the uh, pattern here, and sorry that for whatever reason go to meeting is interacting badly, and so I can't use the animation. But um, the the pattern here of um, uh, the, of each of these panels is the bottom uh, graph shows the amount of precipitation each day, um, and now we're back to familiar units. So these are inches on the left and millimeters on the right. Uh, so you see the particularly rainy periods being you know, a bunch of green bars, and the top curve is the the, the smooth one is the cumulative uh, precipitation over the last 90 days uh, on average, and then the, the jumpier curve is this year. So green is uh, periods when the cumulative precipitation is above average, and brown is when it's below average. Um, so, uh, wet start to the year, a uh, good part of January was wetter than average, but then you see that line sort of flattens out and those green bars on the bottom get fewer. Um, so, fairly dry really from beginning of February until a few weeks ago and then you get this big spike. Um, Pendleton, um, similar, um, you know, a little bit wet and then drier and then uh, recently wet and uh, Pocatello. Um, again, similar uh, similar story um, with uh, uh, recent recent wet weather. Um, so, looking ahead, the climate uh, mapper that John and Catherine have put together reads in the CFS, and uh, so we're starting to get uh, uh, consensus. Um, Outlooks for the next 30 days, and it basically has the whole West being a couple of degrees warmer than average over um, the next 30 days. And I've started to look at weather uh, in a different way. Um, last September, uh, I had a solar array come online, and so now um, I see sunshine as money. And um, the very sunny day of uh, two weeks ago, the 9th, was the highest production we've had yet. And then on the 19th, a few days ago, we broke that record again. And yesterday, we broke the record again. So um, every every uh, sunny day between now and September, I expect uh, it's going to be uh, helping me pay off these, these solar panels. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you. Um, so next we'll have the Climate Outlook with Jeremy Wolf. I'm sorry, could people hear me? My phone was muted. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I had my phone on mute. 
So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be going over the climate and drought outlooks, uh, give an update on La Nina, go through the seasonal outlooks for May, June, and July, go through the drought outlook as well as the flood potential outlook. So let's go ahead and dive into that. So the latest on La Nina is that uh, the ENSO alert system status that the Climate Prediction Center uh, updates monthly is uh, still a La Nina advisory. Uh, this was the statement they made on April 12th because uh, they update this once a month on the second Thursday. Uh, at that time, La Nina conditions were present. Uh, equatorial sea surface temperatures were below average across the central and eastern Pacific Ocean. However, La Nina is expected to transition to ENSO neutral during April and May. Uh, with ENSO neutral then likely greater than 50% chance to continue through the Northern Hemisphere summer of 2018. And if you want to read more on the details of this discussion, there is a link uh, here uh, for the ENSO diagnostic discussion. And also, if you want to read up more uh, on the state of ENSO, they often write many great blogs. Uh, that you can access with the URL there shown on your screen. All right, so on the next slide, this is the historic El Nino and La Nina episodes uh, based on the ONI, which is the Oceanic Nino Index. And it goes back to 2006, and I'm not gonna talk much about the previous episodes, but you can see that the what we need for a La Nina to be officially declared is uh, minus 0 0.5 or colder for five consecutive uh, three-month average periods. And with the uh, minus 0 0.8 that came in for the January, February, March average, that was enough to meet that the five consecutive periods. So this past winter did uh, end up going down officially as a La Nina. So the recent evolution of equatorial Pacific sea surface temperatures uh, during August of 2017, above average values uh, dissipated east of the date line and then below average uh, emerged after that. However, since early of April 2018, so just in the past few weeks, you see a lot of these negative anomalies have dissipated or weakened in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific. And that shows here on the next graphic here for the latest weekly sea surface temperature departures. Uh, it's the 3.4 region that gets analyzed uh, for El Nino and La Nina episodes. And you can see the latest weekly value was minus 0 0.2, which is below that minus 0 0.5 threshold, which is an indication that the La Nina is uh, going away. And this is the sea surface temperature departures in the tropical Pacific during the last four weeks. And during the last four weeks, these were above average in the Western Pacific and below average in the Eastern Indian Ocean and East Central and Eastern Pacific. All right, another important graphic here for looking at El Nino and La Nina is not just the surface anomalies, but going down further uh, this is in the top 300 meters of the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean. And what we see here is the La Nina that uh, we had during the fall and uh, winter with the negative sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, but since the end of February, you can see that the anomalies have been positive and, and increasing. So while some cool water is still lingering right at the surface, there's actually warmer water uh, above normal uh, temperatures uh, below that. So and we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Uh, this is the Climate Prediction Center and the IRI probability of ENSO outlook. So we're coming out of La Nina, but what lies ahead as we go into the summer, as I mentioned before, is neutral conditions. You can see the uh, the gray bars here indicating uh, values greater than 50% through the summer. Then as we go into the fall, you can see the probability of El Nino is starting to slightly increase, uh, getting up close to the 50% threshold. So that's something we'll be keeping an eye on. Uh, right now we are in the spring barrier, 
which means this is the time of year when uh, predicting uh, what's going to happen with El Nino or La Nina or neutral uh, has the lowest skill. So on the next call on uh, June 25th, I believe it was, uh, when we have uh, when we're a couple months further out and we're beyond that spring predictability barrier, we'll probably have a much better idea of uh, the El Nino chances as we head into the fall and winter. Here is the latest model predictions. Uh, so here's where we are with the observed data. As we go forward into the spring, you can see we're, as long as we're between the minus 0.5 and the 0.5, we're in neutral territory. But you can see as we go into next fall uh, and uh, next winter, there are some models that are predicting uh, El Nino conditions, and there's also uh, a few of them that are saying that will be neutral. So uh, well, that will be something we'll be keeping an eye on. All right, so here are the latest uh, seasonal outlooks uh, from the Climate Prediction Center. This is for May, June, and July. And you can see they're predicting elevated chances for warmer than normal temperatures across Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Uh, just slightly elevated. Uh, uh, you can see the stronger probabilities are to our south across the southwest, but slightly elevated odds uh, for those regions and equal chances there across uh, Montana. And for precipitation, uh, slightly elevated odds as well for drier than normal conditions across uh, the same areas, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and uh, parts of western Montana with equal chances for the remainder of Montana. Now moving on to the drought outlook. Uh, this was released uh, just uh, four days ago on April 19th. And uh, right now there is D1 moderate drought that's designated across uh, much of central Oregon. And the outlook as we go through the summer, uh, you can see by these uh, yellow shaded areas, is for that drought to expand slightly across parts of uh, southern Oregon. All right, so that uh, we talked about the, uh, the seasonal outlook and the drought outlook. The last thing I want to discuss is uh, the water supply and flood potential outlooks uh, as we go into uh, the spring. And you can see right now, uh, this is the ascending historic rank. So this is looking back uh, over several years <clears throat> and ranking it historically. And you can see over much of northern Washington and to uh, especially western Montana, uh, there is some places that are at the fifth highest values ever reported uh, for April 21st as far as uh, the water supply forecast going forward. So lots of water up in, uh, in those regions. Uh, down further south, especially across uh, southeast Oregon, you can see uh, it's towards the lower end of the water supply forecast. So not, not as much water availability out there given the drier uh, uh, winter uh, down in that area. All right, now the peak flow forecast. Uh, this is from the uh, River Forecast Center. And one thing I want to mention is, uh, and I had it on the previous slide as well, if you copy and paste this URL at the bottom of the slide here into a web browser, it'll bring up the latest uh, the plots for uh, the the probability of exceeding flood stage. Uh, so this is updated. Uh, you can get the updated uh, value through that to that uh, web browser there or through that URL. Uh, but you can see here are the icons. So the pink is where flooding is very likely 95% chance, and the blue going down to the blues where it's a very low probability. So you can see across much of Oregon and southern uh, Washington and much of western Washington, uh, the probability of flooding the, the spring is very low. Uh, but as you go up into northern Washington, uh, parts of the North Idaho Panhandle and uh, northwest Montana, where we have lots of uh, snowpack out there with values uh, ranging from 125 to 175% of normal across many locations, you can see the flood potential is uh, pretty elevated at several places in the 70 to 90% range. So 
uh, that and actually with the current warm up we're expecting this week with uh, four days of well above normal temperatures some of the river models are predicting that some of this flooding could happen as soon as uh, about a week from now including at uh, the Okanagan River there at Tenasca so uh, so that is the the flood potential outlook as we go into the spring so now I'll move on to my summary. Uh, the Enzo alert status is a La Nina advisory, but again, that is dissipating with neutral expected uh, transition to neutral uh, this month going into May. Uh, the seasonal outlooks May through July favor slightly, ele slightly elevated odds of warmer and drier than normal in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. The drought outlook favors drought persisting in Central Oregon this summer with slight expansion and then lastly, elevated spring flooding risk uh, over North Idaho and Montana and parts of northern Washington. Uh, so that's all I have. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jeremy. We do have uh, one question that we have uh, time to take, and the question is, are there any projections for the next rainy season? For, uh, going into uh, next winter? Uh, is that the, what you mean by rainy season? Uh, that's what I would assume yeah there's no further context in the question uh, that uh, you know I haven't looked closely at the outlooks going out the next winter but I would imagine with the uncertainty with Enzo at this point since uh, uh, whether we're in a La Nina or El Nino often uh, is pretty important for that I would say the confidence is pretty low at this point for the precipitation as we go into the next rainy season. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Sarah Kapnick. Uh, we'll talk about uh, her work on snowpack prediction. Just jumped out. Okay. Um, so my name is Sarah Kapnick. I come from the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, and it's important for me to note that this is uh, research. This is not an operational product um, that I'm going to be showing, but it is research that we're doing to try and be at the forefront of snowpack prediction and seasonal prediction in general with the hopes that um, research like this will become operational in the coming years. Um, so my division at the GFDL is the seasonal decadal variability and predictability division where we are developing models for seasonal prediction of climate and weather. Um, one of the motivations for the study that I'm showing you today is that in the American West you have uh, large regions that have um, needs for water and you also have all the reservoirs that provide that water and transfer the water to where people need it. Um, so we're trying to develop prediction systems that can help um, for these needs for the stakeholders in the West. So how do we develop a Western US prediction system? What are the scientific questions that the scientists at my laboratory, what are we asking? So one, why do we have mountain precipitation and snow? Most of your precipitation occurs in the mountains and is then stored in the reservoirs um, from snow melt and from mountain precip. So why do we have the water where we have it? How does it vary? How does it vary within a season or within many seasons or many years? Uh, can we predict it? Is it possible to know in advance a few weeks, a few months, or even years in advance how much water there's going to be? And then what are we missing in our prediction systems? What should we be thinking about? What are the questions we should be asking? What should we be adding to our systems to enhance them? And then finally, are we even asking the right prediction questions? Um, are we asking the right questions for science and the advancement of science, but also um, given that many of the people on this call, are we also asking the right questions for stakeholders and stakeholder needs? So how do we build the system? Um, to help you visualize our climate models and what we're using for prediction systems, I provided you with these three pictures on the top. Um, so we have global climate models that we use for our prediction systems that we are running at 200 kilometer resolution, 50 kilometer resolution, and 25 kilometer resolution. So that number refers to the uh, length of each, um, size of each box. For these models, we run them on the first of every month, and then we project them out for 12 months to be able to provide four seasons of predictions. And then we also have to make multiple ensemble numbers. So if you're not aware of 
um, such probabilistic forecasts ensemble members, each individual ensemble member provides you a potential future. When you have several of them, you then have a spread of what the potential future is. And having all that information allows you to give probabilities associated with what your predictions are and to understand if the spread is quite large, you have less certainty of what your prediction is. If the spread is much smaller, um, you can hopefully have a um, much more narrow range and more confidence in what your um, future prediction is. So we're using these models, run at these different resolutions to produce seasonal prediction or monthly predictions, seasonal predictions, and multi-year and even decadal predictions. Um, and something to note for all of you from Pacific Northwest is that at these lower resolution models, the 200 kilometer model, it gives us information about seasonal prediction, but it doesn't resolve the mountains. So in the picture on the upper left, is showing that in the, this is elevation with the more red, more orange being high elevation regions. So at lower resolution, these models don't have coastal mountains. They don't have the features that you suddenly get when you move to the 50 and 25 kilometer versions. <clears throat> So how do our model prediction systems do? I'm going to show you results that we've been running the model starting on July 1st, running it through the entire winter, and then giving a prediction of March snowpack, so average March snowpack. So on the left-hand side, these are the predictions that were made um, for the 2012 through 2015 individual years of those winters, which is when there was a large snowpack drought in the southwestern portion of the western US. And the right-hand side are the observations. So these brown colors are very dry, the blue colors are very wet. So we find that we get the general pattern that was actually observed um, during the snowpack drought in our modeling system on the bottom left. So our global climate models run for the entire globe actually are able to give us snowpack predictions um, from July 1st for the following March. <clears throat> so, in addition to looking at individual grid points, which can cause some problems since we have differences in mountains in what is actually where mountains actually are versus what our model resolution models are, we've also divided up um, the Western US into regions, into large climate regions of um, mountainous regions that um, typically have variability that's similar to one another, to be able to parse the West into different regions to provide climate diagnostics and climate scale forecasts. <clears throat> so in the Western US, when we cut it up into these different regions, we're able to test, um, do we have predictive scale of the snowpack in each individual region? So I apologize because this is the most complicated plot that I will show you. And what it's showing is we have the predictions that are made from individual uh, models of the circles the triangles are if you have multiple models put together, so multi-model mean of the predictions. And then we've also included these squares. So often you will hear El Nino predicts that we should have X amount of precipitation or high snow or low snow. Um, I want to ask the question, if you know what the state of these different climate modes are on July 1st and you project it forward, to try and correlate it with the snowpack in March, can that state give you information eight months in advance? Similarly, the models are initialized on July 1st and run out for the entire time and produce snowpack and you compare them with observed snowpack. So what this shows is actually the triangles and the circles tend to have the highest skill. They have higher skill than any of the um, the climate indices for their predictive scale of snowpack. Um, all of these filled circles are statistically significant. The ones that are not are not statistically significant. Interestingly, as well, the only region with statistically significant scale from the ENSO index is actually in the Northern Rockies. So El Nino does, um, state does not give you predictive scale at these time scales um, over the last 36 years. <clears throat> If we really focus in on where our successes, so the um, where all the successes from the models, we find that the highest resolution models, um, so the multi-model mean that those black triangles tend to be the best. They give us the most skill in our seasonal forecasting of snowpack. Um, the only climate mode that gives you some predictive skill most consistently is actually the PNA pattern. Um, additionally, Southern California 
and Washington appear to be the most elusive for prediction scale. They're the hardest places for us to predict snowpack in advance. Um, so this research came out in uh, January. We've been additionally in it. We also thought about why are those regions so difficult to predict? So in the coastal mountains, we've had extreme trends in snowpack loss over the last 36 years. The mountains are very narrow, so they're much more difficult to predict than the larger ranges that we have, um, potentially due to the resolution of our models. Um, also, the storms are less frequent, and um, so precipitation happens in only a couple of days, particularly as you move further south in the western U.S., which may make it more difficult to predict. Additionally, there may be something in our models that's actually causing biases. There may be fundamental issues with our models. Taking all this information, all the research that we've been doing, we're really excited that we have snowpack prediction, but we know we can do better. So we're continuing to work on this to try and improve our prediction and our predictive capabilities for snowpack in the American West. Ultimately, um, gathering all this information on the science side, but also receiving stakeholder feedback allows us to develop our future models and modeling systems. So the question we were asking was pushing forward science of, is snowpack predictable eight months in advance? But now we've been going back to the drawing board, I've been speaking with water managers about, you know, perhaps three months predictions of snowpack is more useful, or five months. And so we've been discussing and figuring out how we're going to advance this system going forward. Um, so I thought I would also touch on how are we going to improve these predictions. So one, the point that I made and is shown by the model results is that when you move to lower resolutions to higher resolutions, you improve your prediction scale. You actually have the mountains. Um, but then there's also other factors. There's the physics of the models and other aspects. Number two, the initialization system. So we have to start the models up on July 1st. So we've done some additional analysis and we have a paper that came out that shows that um, when you have the only the ocean for initializations, which is the top figure A under two, or if you have ocean plus land and atmospheric information to enhance how you're initializing the model, you actually improve precipitation skills. So this is December 1st forecast of precipitation from December through February, where the, major the higher scale is shown in the brighter reds with the dots. And so we're finding that we can enhance our prediction skill for um, in the Western US if we include more and more information. So we're, so we're really testing how we can improve our skill in this region. <clears throat> Number three is then we also need to improve the observations. The observations are important for model development, for initialization and verification. So we're trying to figure out how can we incorporate more observing systems into our research. So ultimately, um, from the snowpack prediction research, we have a question, is California, and you know, also Washington has less prediction scale, is it simply unpredictable at eight month leads? Perhaps there's something missing and that we can enhance, but it may not be. Um, so what problems can we solve? Perhaps different lead times, different variables, use precipitation instead of snowpack, um, and perhaps certain regions are more predictable than others. So we want to improve this, but ultimately there, we may come up against just natural lack of prediction skill in the system. So another thing I want to touch on, the exciting part of what we're doing in research is also trying to improve our models. So the results that I showed you are from uniform grid models that globally have a single resolution, but we're moving towards models that can actually also have enhanced uh, resolution in certain regions. Particularly over the United States, this is very powerful. If we have a prediction system that has really high resolution over North America, we may be able to provide more information in the places that we care about and take the boundary conditions from the lower resolution um, grids around the rest of the world. And this has the benefit of being computationally very efficient. So we can have the really high resolution over North America, but then we don't have to waste our computational power on other parts of the world. <clears throat> So in summary, we're really, really excited. We have snowpack prediction scale eight months in advance in this dynamic couple model system. The prediction information is coming from the initialization of the ocean state, but also from the evolution, from using a global climate model to be able to model all of the climate as it evolves in time. So at these longer timescales, eight months, 
it's really important to have these dynamic models to be able to provide us with this information. If you only have the initial state alone from the climate indices, you do not have the same scale that we can produce when we use the global climate models. Additionally, there are certain regions that have lower scale, California and Washington. However, we have some ideas of a pathway of how we can develop this going forward, how we might be able to improve skill in these regions. We have some promise in some of the research that we're doing, but we're also thinking now about how we might want to reframe our questions for stakeholder needs and to create solvable problems. <clears throat> so any feedback from stakeholders is really key for us to advance this going forward. Finally, the new frontier, we're working on higher resolution grids with global models. Um, we're developing a new model prediction system that we will be calling SPEAR that we're going to start publishing research on this summer. And there's also a new dynamic core in the models that we're using right now, the FE3 dynamic core, which we're using in our GFTL models. It's being transitioned to the National Weather Service. So we're rapidly advancing these models and trying to advance them um, for these needs and for building better prediction systems. So we're very excited about this and we're looking forward to hopefully solving some of these problems in the future. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Sarah. We have a couple of questions for you, but we'll have to keep them um, till after the next speaker. So, um, the, our last speaker was invited by the Northwest Climate Hub. The Northwest Climate Hub provides farmers, ranchers, foresters, and natural resource managers with climate-informed decision support tools, adaptation strategies, and vulnerability assessments. Um, let's see, so the last speaker is uh, Dr. Lee Kalsitz, Assistant Professor of Tree Fruit Physiology with Washington State University. Uh, so go ahead, Lee. Can you hear me and see my talk? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I'm, I guess I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit um, and, and talk about some of the research I've been doing uh, at Washington State University on specifically more or less on Apple but this talk kind of applies to tree fruit in general in Washington State as well as the general Pacific Northwest region. So looking at production in Washington State, so apples are the number one agricultural commodity in Washington State, uh, cherries are number six, grapes are number nine, and pears are number ten. So uh, tree fruit as a whole um, encompassed a lot of economic value to Washington State and to the whole Pacific Northwest region. Um, one, of the, we, one of the advantages of growing fruit in the Northwest is it's a really good environment to grow tree fruit. We have a lot of sunlight, we have good temperatures, we have low disease pressure, low insect pressure, but in reality we're, we're growing fruit that's right on the edge of being suitable. And it is entirely dependent on an abundant supply of irrigation water. Uh, on a stable supply, so relying on snowpack coming from, down from Canada to feed the Columbia River, as well as the tributaries um, coming, in, coming down from the Cascade Mountain Range. So it's dependent on that snowpack, that uh, accumulation of suitable snowpack and slow melt periods to supply water right through the whole growing season into August and September to uh, bring the fruit to maturity to, to harvest. So we're growing in this desert environment, we're growing right on the edge. So what happens if we go a little bit warmer or that snowpack decreases a little bit, a little bit more and, and we're kind of going, going over that edge of what's being suitable? What management strategies can we develop or can we uh, uh, propose for the industry to help mitigate some of that effects and make it through those drought periods or those high temperature periods? So to put it in, in context, this is on a global scale. I borrowed this from a New York Times article, um, basically talking about the showing the number, how the number of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit are going to change on a global scale. And I have the, so the Pacific Northwest is forecasted to go from five days over 95 to 22 days over 95. So I think that that resolution of that number probably includes the west side. Um, I think probably on the east side, we're probably at 22 days right now over 95. So we're, we're looking at almost doubling that in the future. The Midwest, Northeast US, 
that those the number of days over 95 degrees Fahrenheit is, is going to significantly increase. Um, other tree fruit production regions in Chile, South Africa, Australia, Europe. So we see this this increase in temperature, specifically days over 95. So when I when I talk about days over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, um, a reason why 95 degrees Fahrenheit is so important for for apples specifically is the development of fruit sunburn. So in in Washington we have these these trellised orchard systems planted out in a, in a semi-arid or desert environment that are entirely reliant on irrigation water. And so when, when these, this fruit is exposed, when the air temperature reaches about uh, 40 degrees Celsius, we can get what's called sunburn necrosis. So that's these, this basically cooking of the skin of the fruit. So the fruit surface temperature is reaching 52, 52 to 53 degrees Celsius when the air temperature is about 40 degrees Celsius and it's, and it's sunny outside. And so we can lose fruit this way. We can lose what's called sunburn browning, where the air temperature when combined with light um, increases the fruit surface temperature to about 47 degrees Celsius. So that's really when the air temperature is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the threshold for the development of sunburn browning. And this Sunburn browning results, results in a loss of about 10% of the apple crop in Washington state on average um, in, a, in a given year. So if the number of days are increasing that are above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to have increases in sunburn pressure because of this high temperature. So when you look at the last uh, five growing seasons on average, so this is the black line, you look at the number of the days reaching 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and there was about four or five, maybe six days that reached that, that threshold for sunburn browning. Um, on average, taking the 2012 to 2017 average. When you look at it on an individual season, um, this is climate, this is a, a temperature data taken, taken from Wenatchee uh, near our research station. And from 2015 to 2016, you can see there are a lot of days that surpassed that threshold. And, and this threshold is not a, a set threshold. We're still working at identifying uh, whether some cultivars are different, whether during developmental stages the, that threshold might be different. So really there's a, there's a what I call a risk, uh, a, ri a risk threshold at about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. This is when the growers generally will take, uh, start to use strategies to, to limit sunburn. And you look at the amount of days above that, that's pretty, pretty much consistent sunburn risk from the end of June all the way through to the middle of August on any given year. So we have a lot of sunburn pressure and if that's going to increase, we need to develop strategies to mitigate that. So currently uh, what the industry uses are either evaporative cooling where they take, uh, they basically cycle on uh, water over top of the orchard instead of using drip irrigation or sprinklers underneath just watering the ground and being more water efficient they put water over top of the trees for 20 minutes then they turn it off and they use the evaporative cooling effect to cool the fruit surface temperature and then they cycle through these hot days they cycle on and off cooling the fruit and as you can probably suspect that's, pro that's not very water efficient and it, it the in, or the growers then lose the ability to control the water in their soil. They become actually in some cases when they're when they go through a sustained hot period, they can that water that soil can become very saturated and unhealthy for the trees in general. Um, but when you don't have a choice, this is the most effective solution. Another thing the growers will do is apply what's called kaolin clay, and it's a particulate reflective material that you can spray on the fruit. And it's it's a uh, it's a natural material uh, uh, mined from the soil and sprays on the fruit and sticks to the so to the fruit to reflect off excess radiation and reduce uh, sunburn and, and it is effective but it also is very difficult to get off in the after the fruit's been harvested it leaves the fruit very white and it's very hard to clean off and it also affects the tree growth so you can in fact. Uh, guess that that this white particle spray sprayed on leaves, the leaves wouldn't photosynthesize as efficiently as they would if they were fully exposed. So these two strategies work, but 
they're not the most ideal. So the last two to three years I've been doing work with protective netting. And this netting uh, work was originally developed as hail protection, but in desert environments, it acts as a double protectant, uh, protectant to reduce fruit surface temperature. And it does that by reducing the amount of radiation reaching the fruit surface or reaching the canopy. And what we found is not only does it reduce sunburn and it's, it's more or less as, equi uh, as effective as evaporative cooling, but it also actually enhances tree health because in Washington, in, in the, in growing in the semi-arid environment with a very high light, we have the trees actually have much more light than they can use. So even by reducing 20%, we're still above that threshold of what the trees can use normally. Um, so the trees are actually more productive underneath the nets. They photosynthesize longer in the day, they show less signs of stress, and they grow more. Um, and they grow higher quality fruit. So not only is it reducing sunburn, but it's also increasing tree health. And another benefit is that by reducing the amount of radiation and also reducing wind speed um, of wind hitting the, going through the canopy, it's also reducing water use. And so we just, we're just starting up a project in the next two to three years to quantify how much water we're actually saving by having growing trees under this protective netting. Uh, so as a water conservation measure. So to, uh, going into water conservation, so we've seen what, what uh, issues can come up uh, in 2015 in the summer drought, uh, where there were water restrictions put in place specifically in the Yakima Valley uh, that was particularly hard hit. Um, one of the challenges with the tree fruit industry, and, and we're, we're hoping to get going in the next two to three years on a, on a new project, is to, uh, what I'd say, identify strategies to get them through these periods. So even if their water is restricted by 60%, what can they do? How can they, they manage those trees to make sure that it's gonna produce a crop the next year and the year after? And even though they might be giving up their crop this year, they're not ending up with a, a dead orchard like you see on the right. Um, that they're able to manage their irrigation in a way that they can keep the trees alive so that they're productive the following year. Because what we've seen is that that these droughts may or may, or may not be as sustained. Um, so one year they might be a problem. Well, 2016 wasn't wasn't a problem. We had we had good snowpack the following year. So if they can develop strategies to get through these drought periods uh, where there's water restrictions and and then keep the keep the crop productive the following year, that's that's kind of the best case scenario. So it's kind of a contingency approach to managing water that they're giving up this year's crop, but keeping the perennial crop going. So I've, I've kind of just picked out some points to um, some of the challenges for improving water management in tree fruit. And, you know, some of the challenges is our outdated irrigation equipment. Um, some of the equipment and monitoring strategies are a little outdated. It, it, then forces them to rely on schedules, scheduled irrigation rather than demand irrigation. And it's also linked to the unavailability of labor to manage that. So if they don't have the controls in place or the irrigation system in place that allows them to automate everything, then they need to do that manually. And during specific times of the year, they don't have the labor to, to control the irrigation for their orchards manually because they're out picking cherries or they're out uh, doing other tasks that have a higher priority. Um, not to say that this isn't a, this isn't a, a high priority, but it's just the, the unavailability of labor, the labor restrictions that are constantly in place for the tree fruit industry. Um, another thing is that uh, right now there's, there's less incentives and reward systems in place for water conservation, uh, specifically for senior water rights holders, which can be a concern. Um, there's really no no incentive for them to conserve water, so they're not gonna they're not gonna put it in place. So if we can show them ways that they can conserve water and have a economic benefit to them, they're more likely to adopt those strategies. And that's where we're going with the protective netting, is that we're seeing that it improves quality and also conserves water at the same time. Another thing is we don't really understand um, certain thresholds 
physiological thresholds for making irrigation decisions in tree fruit, specifically apple and, and sweet cherry uh, and pear. Uh, so if we can develop those thresholds, and we're hoping to do that in the next two to three years, we can we can uh, make allow the growers to make more informed decisions on how they manage their water and to manage it more precisely than they would have if they were going on a, just normally going on a schedule. And, and another thing is that uh, infrequent drought events make these conservation efforts unpredictably valuable. So in 2015, conservation efforts would have been incredibly valuable to go in, problem solve, allow them to get some of those orchards through that drought period. But then 2016 comes along and, and the snowpack is good. And so there's just not as much focus as there probably should be on preparing for the next drought. So short memories and, and uh, kind of the, the infrequent droughts uh, make it so that it's, it's just not as valuable on a, on a long-term basis to continue to invest in conservation. But when it does come up, it becomes extremely important. So we need to develop strategies uh, for them to get through these short-term periods of drought. So this is kind of two of the applied ways of, of water conservation. One I already talked about with netting, and the other um, is showing an economic benefit of water conservation uh, this is an example using Honeycrisp apple. So Honeycrisp apple is now the number five, the fifth most produced apple in Washington state. Nationally, it's a very popular variety and continuously growing. But one of the problems is, is that it's an oversized fruit, the fruit's too big. Um, and the oversized fruit gets a, gets a lower price. And it also develops this, this uh, uh, problem called bitter pit. So I've been developing the last two years uh, uh, some thresholds for irrigation to decrease fruit size and also decrease bitter pit and honeycrisp. So using uh, water conservation approaches or deficit irrigation. And what we found is that we're able to reduce bitter pit and conserve water at the same time. So having these dual benefit applied approaches uh, seem to be uh, much more readily adopted by the industry than just focusing on water conservation by itself. Hi, Lee, we have a couple of uh, questions to get you. Would you mind wrapping up in a minute? Yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I basically wrapped up just, uh, you know, we need to focus on, on preparing for increased summer temperatures and dealing with the inconsistency in water availability in Washington State because both of those are gonna be persistent in the future. So with that, I'll, I'll answer any questions. All right, thank you, Lee. Um, so I'm gonna come back to some questions we had for earlier speakers first. Uh, one is, I think for Jeremy, is there any outlook for the fire season this summer? Uh, the fire season outlook uh, that gets issued from uh, NIFC and Boise uh, with input from all the geographic regions. And the latest outlooks that were issued on April 1st had much of Oregon, uh, I believe central Oregon, and parts of Idaho in a, a in a above normal risk uh, as we go into the summer. Uh, so I'm bringing that up right now just to uh, get the uh, the latest map. So it was starting in July. So normal fire potential through June, and then in July, uh, central and southeast Oregon as well as the east slopes of the central and southern Washington Cascades and the Columbia Basin, North Idaho and Montana, all in above normal fire potential starting in July. Thanks, Jeremy. Would you mind sending the link to that to Britt so she can um, send that to folks who are interested? Yes, I can send her that. Thanks. Okay, our next question for Sarah. Um, for the slide showing the verification of March snowpack to the July first forecast, uh, there wasn't a, leg a legend. What were the brown colors representing? The, the oh. slide with the map on it. Oh, for the brown, I mentioned this when I was saying it. The brown colors were um, less snow, anomalously low snow values. Okay, I'll, thank I'll you. I'll add a legend to the posted figure. Okay, another question for you. Uh, when determining the skill ENSO has on snowpack, were you correlating the July ENSO index to the following March snowpack, or was it the ENSO index sometime during the winter? 
It was the Enzo Index available from the month of June, so it was what was available on July 1st. So it's after the springtime barrier that was mentioned. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, why do you think the PNA is the climate index with the most skill? So we actually have some interesting research suggesting that the PNA pattern um, early in the summer in the summer um, actually can have some consistency with storm tracks uh, later in the year that there's a certain condition from the summer that may um, lead to some persistence of where the storm tracks are located. Um, there isn't any expectation that the PNA pattern actually has a long-term predictive scale. Um, it may be actually some, suggesting something deeper in the climate system um, in terms of storm tracks, but it needs more work. All right, thank you. Last question is for Lee. What does the netting do to the cost of production? Yeah, so the, the netting costs about $10,000 per acre. Um, we've done some kind of basic economics on it, and it adds about between $2,500 and $3,500 per acre per year uh, additional revenue through increased fruit quality and decreased fruit losses. So it takes about three to four years to pay off, and then after that, it's it's a uh, profit. All right, thank you. Uh, well, that's um, all for us today, and, and Britt will send out that link to the fire forecast so everyone can take a look at that. Uh, thank you all for joining, and uh, please join us next time on June 25th. All right, have a good day.